Making life worth living and retirement worth having is about the people we allow in our lives. Lord God produces the magic for us. When we meet someone new, when we create a new acquaintance, a new liaison, a new networking connection for professional business, or we seek one out because of something going on for us personally. In the magic that the Lord provides, he puts us at the right spot at the right time. In the mayhem that people provide, they don't react well sometimes to a new connection. I find that so incredibly odd because the entire purpose of our land was about people finding new ways, new strategies, new authorities, new opportunities for life. Isn't that what we've seen in some of those old films that some of the popular stars produce that show us about how the Wild West was or how settlers came here and did things and traded with Indians and made us have all these feel-good, warm, fuzzy moments to remind us of the empowerment of the people in America. But in truth, this is a holiday season time, when families gather together, when kids are finally off school, when parents who are working have to deal with latchkeyness, and openly they eventually get home for the holidays. Home for the holidays means something different to every person in every land and every different aspect of the world that celebrates the holiday season. In Japan, we literally buy a Christmas cake of sorts. I didn't tolerate them putting in all this crazy crap like they do, do in England uh, with my family, but we would buy a cake and exchange modest presents. The Japanese nation certainly does know how to market and materialize things, so they created a holiday on Christmas trees and other aspects of holiday, but I don't remember a lot because it's been a while since I lived there. But in truth, there are other holidays through Japanese culture that we don't have in America exactly, but we have named them different things, and we do different things at those times of year, similar to they might do abroad. But we're talking about the holiday here, this season, and how Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights and other aspects of Kwanzaa and other parts of Christmas itself mean something to people of faith. See, people of faith are putting God first, in theory. They're celebrating by giving gifts to other people, and I'm not really sure how that came about other than the story of St. Nicholas and how he gave to the poor, but how many people in this world actually are giving to the poor this season? What I find fascinating are the shelters and the organizations, the non-for-profits that actually help the poor, shut down over the holidays. They don't have volunteers in place who are ready to give up their holidays for the poor, and that sort of means that people who get their food regularly from those places will have no food at all this holiday season. It's a real shame, but it is what I found when I literally did my research looking for a place to stay. The other truth that we learn very easily is that most of the shelters are quite full. Second truth we learn from talking to anyone who's a part of a good Samaritan-oriented network is literally there are not enough shelters. The third fact we learn is that politicians in affluent communities don't want to put any shelters in the community, will not give up any land for that matter, and yet we have the largest churches of the world in some of our cities that literally serve supposedly 10 to 12,000 members, maybe only six to seven in theory on a regular weekend basis if they have four or more services. But practically, these buildings sit virtually empty throughout the week. We have sort of gotten away from the concept of the old adage of a friar tuck who would bring in people who were of need, who would shelter the poor, who would protect women from harm. And openly, we certainly have a lot of groups that protect women from harm, but we don't literally have the same amount of groups that protect men from harm. There's plenty of men who've been battered, there's plenty of men who've been beaten, there's plenty of men who've been raped, and there's been plenty of people of different walks of life who have suffered at the hands of a lot of people who feel like they're doing something in the name of God. Now, the name of God is something we have to take great care with. The name of God produces a lot of meaning. The name of God has many actual forms of the name of God, if you literally are looking at the historic literature like the Bible or other historic works that literally will tell you there's a hundred different type of names for God in this land, but also in different languages because then when the Tower of Babel that I like to talk about was discussed in the Bible, it literally said that God divided the world so that people would have to work a little harder at communicating, be a little less over-focused than trying to be supreme to God, and be a little bit more humbled in their abilities to discuss the Lord. 
You see, we have incredible figureheads like the Dalai Lama who talk about peace, and I lovingly have a set of his oracle cards that help me to feel good when I pull the right cards for myself. I also carry a cross that was literally destroyed in a impounding situation, along with other parts of my faith. The truth is, every personal item on my being is an aspect of my practical faith. Whether it's influenced by Japan, or whether it's influenced by China, or practically whether it's influenced by my Christian heritage and upbringing in the land of America, where Christianity and Christendom is supposed to be reign supreme, especially at holiday season. But in truth, we have a lot of Christians out there who literally do things in the name of the Lord they think. They do horrible things sometimes by shooting up places and bombing facilities and doing all sorts of stuff that destroy life. Our own military participates in that sort of thing to take out the infidels of the world, but sadly, there's plenty of infidels right here in America that are totally subversive in their approach. They blend in. They look like the rest of us. They learn to walk the talk and talk the talk, and yet they put into the world horrible programs that ruin our computers, technologies that take away our privacy, and they literally are much better well-studied and much better well-read about a lot of literature in the world because their educational system might, in fact, actually be superior to ours. Now, I was raised in a time when education was sort of a so-so movement, so I can't say that I'm the most superior intellectually. But openly, I know that other lands put a lot of emphasis on education because it practically gets them into different types of career sets and career minds, and that's something I got quite well in Japan when I was a college professor over there. Openly, that was a land away a time ago, and I'm much older now. I can sit in a coffee shop literally listening to men talk about business and sit there and go, what in the hell are they accomplishing in this hour of time? Absolutely nothing. I could have given this man an entire plan in an hour with a whiteboard. If he had taken notes or a computer, we could have planned the whole thing. He could have gotten the whole thing for free, but openly, everyone has to make a living. The end of the conversation resulted in a fact that they were going to meet again, and I thought, wow, that's great, but no money exchanged hands, and they had a social time because they were participants in some sort of organization together, but in reality, I didn't really see anything free-flowing. What I saw was a man sort of hollering because I had to suffer through listening to most of the conversation because they weren't talking at any quiet, professional, confidential level. And practically, the restaurant that I was in wasn't all that full, giving the background noise to my own mind, thinking about the things I needed to plan for my life. But openly, I'm talking about the holidays. How are your holidays shaping up? I have one wish for this Christmas, and it's been my same wish virtually since almost 2011, to see the one that I love to meet that girl one more time at least, to have a holiday moment with her, to give her the gifts that I lovingly made, but the problem is someone destroyed some of those gifts. They literally ruined gifts for children, to the point that I was carrying them on me. They stole soap that I'd lovingly carried through the heat that melted together, that were sort of a mess. They stole that from my property and impound. They took clothes that I purchased lovingly for her, to have at holiday time. I hadn't had a chance to wrap them yet. They got into private intimate things. They took things out of a medical bag and threw them into the gift bag, and they monkeyed around in a lot of stuff thinking they'd just do it for the hell of it, or to prove something in their own life that they had some sort of power. What I see is an illness, an illness and a belief that they are Lord of all, and yet this holiday season is about the Lord of utmost highest integrity, honor, life, liberty, and most importantly, love. You see, peace on earth is what we sing about in Silent Night and other wonderful historic Christmas songs and hymns that have been produced through the religion that has surpassed most all others in our land in terms of staying time. Let's face it, I've said this before, that Jesus is an amazing marketing guy, especially at Easter. I produced a article in a blog post long ago that got a lot of good claim from my networking group because I really talked about the importance of how forgiveness plays in our lives. It means that we can practically see someone we haven't seen in years, just walk up to them, embrace them in some polite, professional, or loving way, and everything can melt away if both hearts are ready for it. You see, when the Lord puts people on a person's path, it's pretty obvious. 
They become instant fast friends, faithful to the last, until something falls apart, or someone says, leave me alone. The funny thing is when you try and say, leave me alone to family, they don't always listen, and I have that problem regularly. All of my siblings have destroyed my legal name in some way or another, and openly they still think I'm going to sit there and let them do it over and over again. What they fail to realize is that police may be watching them by now, and openly I let the FBI know about their little lying shit long ago. So when they figure that out, the police of the police might actually get off their butt and do something, or they'll just harm me further like they like to do to people who tell the truth in the world. Practically, we could have had great good energy long ago by a man whose now his name is on a car, Tulsa. Tesla, sorry, I said it wrong first. But in truth, the reality is he might have lied, or it might have been truth, but who would know because at some point he was shot and something happened to him, and he's no longer with us, but now we've got cars by their name, and we've got efficiencies that we're looking at of how to produce less gas prices. Openly, I've talked about the theft at the pump, and I'm pretty sure it's still going on, but I've lost my car to impound. Because I had a public defender who didn't defend my rights to keep my car as a homeless person as a place to have lodging away from this sadistic family that I have as a birth family. But openly I'm getting a little off track, but that is sort of the stories of the life of people who see Christmas differently. You see, I know that Christmas is about the Lord in heaven. But a lot of people make Christmas about the shopping, the gift giving, the parties, the relationships with colleagues and workers, but they don't really think about their intimate relationship with the Lord. They also don't think about how the Lord interacts with other people in this land. There's a lot of holy roller types who think that they know the Lord created certain people, they didn't create others, and it's Satan who's driven these people away from some biological concept they have in their mind, and I sit there literally going, okay, you obviously didn't get the first part of Genesis, which literally said the Lord God made them all. The Lord God loves them all. The Lord God knows it all. The Lord God is omnipotent, omniscient, and any other om, omni toward a word you'd like to say about him. Multi-purposeful is not quite right, but openly that's the implication you get from the book of Genesis, and it's sort of the same in the Quran, which I had the lovely opportunity to read a few passages from the other day, and I really liked how it was written. I liked how that translator translated it. It spoke to my soul, much like many works of Confucius and Mencius speak to my soul. They put the Bible in perspective for me. They're just a different take on things we get from our Christian proverbs and everything else. Japanese proverbs are absolutely wonderful. I have a couple books, hopefully still, of proverbs in my storage unless someone pilfered those, but that's what happens to a man. The minute someone decides to hit a person's life, they just keep going. They try and hit them into the mud. Now, does that mean produce the fact that they are a spiritual person? Not in the least. It pretty much shows they have no concept of God, they have no intimate relationship with the heavenly host of all. They do not have an understanding of how God produces life for people. And they certainly have no regard for the relationships that the Lord puts in people's lives if they lie, steal, and cheat a person away from their lawful right and their lawful relationships. You see, I've had journals that have had pages stolen from them of all my contacts. I've literally had passwords of my computers ripped out of journals where I was keeping track of when I made changes. The only people in my life to have access for that is pretty much family, who lie about having key copies of car keys to my vehicle. So the loss of this vehicle is not necessarily of a horrible thing, but being in a community that doesn't have a good walking path is sort of difficult. Staying in a community where people are policed and dogged and ruined by the person of interest technology is also sort of passive-aggressive patronization of a community service that should literally be protecting everyone's rights, not just some people's rights or just the affluence rights. In life, we have these wonderful shops like the Dollar General, who is one of my favorite stores to shop at. Not only do they have good food in cans, which I need to eat, but openly they have good prices and fair, reasonable things, even with name brands, are starting to support that little store, which I think is absolutely lovely. We have an opportunity to make a life worth living and a life worth having for all people, regardless of their affluence. But we openly need more training for those folks available in community centers like Ivy Tech and others that say, look, you're struggling right now financially. We can teach you financial prowess, 
but we hopefully have to teach you how to socialize in a way that moves your life into the appropriate circles so that you are influenced properly by men and women of affluence who literally know how to get stuff done, know how to make dreams occur, and literally know how to produce new ideas and new marketing ways that really make a difference in the lives of human beings and their little families back at home waiting for them this holiday season to come home from the job because the kids are out of school and mom's still at work or dad's still at work. Because practically holidays are not the same level of opportunity here in America. When I worked in Japan, we had roughly six weeks of holiday time because of all the national holidays. I don't think I ever got that many. I think I got like 14 days max when I was in corporate America in manufacturing and doing corporate communications for a company. But openly, that's not the point. The point is that the holiday time is about the people who have a life with God to celebrate that life, to listen to sermons by different pastors or the same one, depending on how good the series is, and literally to think about how the God plans our life. He plans who we're going to meet and what lessons we're going to gain and at what point we should possibly remove them from our life. There's other moments of time where our own stupidity removes someone from our life, and then our life goes to hell in a handbasket, and we sit there wondering why, and the absolute truth is because we didn't listen to God saying, go fix that relationship right now, stop being so vile, stop thinking you're above it all, and stop thinking it doesn't matter to that person anymore. Because when the souls really meet, when the souls really join, when we have a soul-keeping relationship, as I talk about in my Christian book work that I wrote long ago in love with two women who totally influenced my life, not my family, not my siblings, not my metaphysical instructor, but two loving women who just so moved my soul that I wrote sort of in a way to teach and to learn and to feel my way through the loss of them, that openly soul keepers make all the difference for us. They love us into a higher ground. They push on us to be better. They divide us when it's not right, but openly they also tell us important wisdom, important truths, and they give us a lot of wit and fun in our life. I had a loving woman who came into my life who was Catholic. She literally wanted to learn some of the things I knew spiritually, and I learned from her about her Catholicism. I literally went to a Catholic church after meeting her and got beamed with holy water, which I wasn't really thrilled about, but I knew the father who was doing it, and I thought, okay, he's telling me something. He smacked me right up in the face with holy water that maybe I needed to be chastised or maybe I need to be cleansed. I wasn't really sure because who knows what that man of his age of 80s as he is could have seen around me in the spiritual realm. You see, when you take a vow of poverty like he did, he literally just had his brown robes, the cord that binds them together, and maybe a jumpsuit or two to wear when he travels. They don't wear that garb every single day. It's hot in the summer, but it is their honorable robes. And he literally has lived that life of poverty. He's traveled the world. He speaks multiple languages. He's written several books. He's got incredible meditation CDs. And openly, he's a loving man for the most part. Now think about a life like that with no property whatsoever. I sort of learned a little bit about that in my homelessness, that I really could get away with having virtually nothing. Even though I traveled with a lot to try and protect my intellectual property, what I realized is that families already destroyed every little production that I've made for my kanji camp program. They literally thought they had the lawful right to get into my hard drives and delete it all. Isn't that amazing? That a man can produce an incredible life's work of how to learn a really difficult language and some sibling thinks they just thought, He's not doing this anymore. We're just going to destroy this and piss on him. Underneath federal law, that's a federal offense. Underneath biblical law, that is beyond an abomination to the Lord. Because where does that person think that that individual got that love of that language or that spirituality from? The Lord. Because it says in Genesis, Lord God made them all, which literally means Lord God made all the interests and all the interesting things about that individual that make that person 100% unique. You see, the loving gal that I talked about, who was Catholic, also lost things in my life. When she decided to destroy that relationship and behave in an immature way, spiritually, socially, and emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, and otherwise, it literally ruined her own life too. Because once you make a mark on someone's life, it makes a mark on your life. 
And once you lose that relationship, you lose the benefits of the relationship that the Lord had put in place. The same goes for the other woman who is a part of the muse aspect of that book. That while she inspired me to do a lot of things, I had hoped she would inspire me to make millions, but that was not the case. That was not the plan of the Lord, and that was not the purpose of our relationship. You see, I pretty much have got the plan that was supposed to happen from that relationship, and she still hasn't gotten it in her mind that God produces life in these ways. Openly, I've been supposedly accused of destroying life for her, and I don't even know how that's possible because I haven't seen her in maybe six years or more. But I still think about her literally every day. I still miss her little soul in my life. And I so miss that humor that she had that just would make me light up because she was so brilliant, intellectually funny, professionally astute, socially well endowed, and openly it didn't matter what she looked like to me. What mattered was how her soul made my soul feel. And that's the truth. That openly a man is looking for someone who helps them to light his own light to inspire his own life. And when I lost her, I lost all inspiration. I lost every bit of inspiration I had in my life. I literally almost shut down. The loss of her nearly killed my life. It literally almost took me home to God. I remember that moment in time. I remember slipping through the veil. I remember the slipstream, the gray strand that is talked about in that wonderful animated Mexican film literally starting to pull through my being. But if you say that to someone who's not a person of faith, especially anybody in the scientific realm, they'll say you're mentally unwell, there's not a possibility, and you just want to smack them across their face because the life we have, the souls we produce in our lives, the people that we cross paths with are totally on the God's plan. I know this a lot more now because of how well I listen to what God says to me now. You see, in my life, I've had to explore a part of the community that was a little bit intimidating for me, as as my friend Claudia, who's a very gifted woman, says, I was sheltered. I never really got why she said that until now. That's true. I had a father who was very loving, who made sure that we had the right training, the right social skills, for the most part, professionally anyway, Not necessarily socially. We didn't get a lot of opportunities for that because my mother was too overwhelmed with how many children she had and my father's monstrous behavior a lot of times. But in truth, openly, she literally got how to make things right. And I guess what I mean by that is when she told me that, I've now been through that community. I've now learned how to handle things. I've learned how to handle men who are out of control and taking away other people's rights. I've learned to see the vile men who stand outside and try and hit on people for things that they don't want to get off their own ass for and work for, literally. I've seen the women who lie and snitch to police. I've seen all of that going on in the Indianapolis community. And openly, for the most part, there's not a soul on the street except police officers blazing by, putting on their lights, you know, basically harassing the people who are wanting to be out in the middle of the night. You see, the Lord gives everybody a different time schedule a different biological clock. We also have people who work late. They might get a free pass to walk to their car, but anyone who's walking down the street with a set of bags because they couldn't find a hotel, God forbid they walk by any place downtown. Now, I can make light of it because it's the holiday season, and I can tell the stories because I've actually experienced it, but openly those gals made such an impact on my life, those three women, really, including the one who loved me a long time, changed my soul. I was literally standing in a court situation yesterday or the day before, openly listening to a patronizing woman who had no lawful right underneath human rights law to say the crap to me that she was saying, and I literally just shut my eyes like we do in Japan. It's a cultural thing. I've lived that life now more than 20 years, having Japanese culture influence my entire being, and I just shut my eyes. Why? To not be distracted by her face, to simply listen to her words. And that's what we do in Japanese business meetings. We don't want any distraction to make our mind go places that would interrupt another person's right to speak. We also don't want to be flippant. We don't want to be arrogant in our listening. We don't want to be presumptive in where that person's going with their story. And that's why we close our eyes. It was sort of an effective method because it sort of made her mind her mouth a little bit more. She violated so many laws in what she said it wasn't even funny. But openly, if I say that, I might be hit by someone for that truth. And literally, I've seen all the lies, and it just keeps compounding because every time I tell the truth, they hit me with lies. 
And that's the vileness of the world. And I have to sit there and go, it's the holiday time. This is the time of the Lord, and people continue to lie, steal, and cheat a man from a life. Now, when we talk like this, when we walk like this, when we think like this, when we do things like this, physicians and other mental health people who have no faith whatsoever are probably beyond their realm in what they know about the world in their own minds. Don't realize how much the Lord might just take them down a peg this holiday season. It won't be me, for sure. I don't get into that sort of revenge game. I certainly don't play with people's property. I don't steal from them. I don't talk to them. I don't do anything like that. But openly, other people are watching them completely. Their own colleagues, their own underlings, their own people who are witnesses to a situation, and openly, maybe larger-than-life people. But in truth, what we have to look at is this holiday time. How do we utilize the time to make sure that we are on God's path in all the relationships that he's put in our life? And sometimes it requires us to stop thinking we are in control of our lives and realize that the Lord God made them all. And when we get out of control, trying to patronize, trying to ruin, trying to steal from another human being, that God will eventually hit us into the literal ground and show us not to do that again. In my life, I've longed to see only one person, possibly two, for a long time. I'd of course love to see my son again. I love him very much, and openly, I was a parent of him for a long time, age eight until his 20s, somewhere, 24, 25, 27, I can't remember now. I'm old, I'm allowed a little bit of mis misunderstanding. But openly, if I share that information, honestly and truthfully, someone else is going to try and hit me with all sorts of lies that they have in their mind about what is and isn't right. And the truth is, it's not their lawful right to say. They were not there every single day of the week. They did not fight for him for his, his cultural educational rights. They did not tolerate the lies he had to put up with. And openly, they did not school him in English. And I taught him how to speak English. I taught him how to read, write, literally, from day one. And openly, despite our difficulties in being a step-parent to a step-child, I still love him as my son. I have removed him, unfortunately, from my little aspect of being my legal heir because his mother has been somewhat insistent on it. She's got a new man and he can provide for him then in his old age. In my life, I've chosen who I want to provide for. And I've got siblings, older siblings, who think they have some lawful right to try and manhandle my federally protected legal documentation on this matter. And I just want to smack them. I spent my entire life paying into those loving things my father put in place for me. Who the hell gives them the right to tell me who I can't leave my money to? It is not their lawful right to do. Now, I'm talking about gifting. I'm talking about bequeathing. My father bequeathed me a set of wonderful presidential coins. I literally set them on a shelf in a room in which I'm staying, and they are now gone completely. Who gave that person the lawful right to come in to this room where I'm staying and take them? I don't know. Openly, it's a lie they tell themselves that they're going to take this now because I left it there. No, it's illegal. And if I accidentally threw it away, it's illegal for them to get in the trash. I went out to the trash to check just in case I might have done that, and it's illegal. For all I know, I could have thrown them out in the grass, but I know I had them here in the house. In life, we have to figure out what we do to make a life worth living in retirement with having. I had the lawful right to sell those coins if I wanted to. I openly have the lawful right to give them away if I wanted to. I was going to bequeath them to my legal heirs, which is one girl and her sons. My lawful right. Nobody else is to take from me. That's what love does, people. It says, I love you, and if I die, I want you to have my stuff. It might not produce a lot of money. It might have to all go to goodwill or it could produce 15 grand according to how much my property was supposedly worth until someone got into storage and started monkeying around in my property, stealing my religious objects and other things. But that's what people do. I've even had t-shirts stolen from storage. Stuff I set aside to pick up and wear a little later, completely gone, religious t-shirts. Now, at what point do we stop people and say, look, this is the land of love, peace, honor, dignity that so many warriors, so many fighters, so many Army, Navy, Air Force fought to protect, and you're monkeying it up with your ill will and your lies about what are your rights in someone's life. So when people sing this song about honor and 
people who died for our, our opportunities and freedom. Let's get real. When you violate someone's rights, when you infiltrate their documents, their paperwork, their property, their personhood, you voyeur on their life, their body, or anything else, you have just denied all those men and women who died for our rights. You literally did that. In this land of the Lord, where Christendom still sort of reigns, and faith practices still are acceptable underneath our own freedom of religion, it's time for us to honor the Lord in heaven, to literally say God is the most important being in this world, and no other comes before him or her in this land. Now, does that mean I'm saying religious freedom is good for all people? No. That little act has ruined the lives and opportunities of a lot of people. In the name of God, which wasn't right. You see, God creates it all. God creates all loving relationship. God creates all opportunities in life. God creates every little thing. And that's the truth. So when we try to deny someone rights where God has given them rights, it's really kind of a crazy idea that man thinks they're better and more knowledgeable than God. And that's what this holiday season is about, is celebrating Lord Jesus' birth, who is literally the son, the man version of the Lord, as we've been taught, but really the son of God, and mother God too. Now, we're talking about a lot of things. We're talking in free-form journalism. We're talking about story. We're talking about life. We're talking about authentic, soul-searing, soul-searching, perhaps, soul-giving, soul-full conversation. This is Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications, LLC, saying thanks for listening.